Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Again and again in recent years, we have seen proof that a nation unalert and unprepared invites attack or collapse from within. Today's big picture, deals with two of the keystones to American security, the citizen soldier and our defense perimeter. One of the most strategic outposts in our defense perimeter is Hawaii. time, 7.55 on a Sunday morning. Most of us were still in bed, but asleep or awake, in Hawaii or on the mainland, for the first time in a generation, Americans everywhere tasted destruction and death and defeat. Looking back today, we're able to come up with accurate statistics. Pearl Harbor was attacked by 105 aircraft, dive bombers, torpedo planes, and horizontal bombers. Every US battleship and most of the smaller ships in the area were disabled or damaged beyond repair. Nearly 200 Army and Navy planes were lost. But in 1941, no one needed statistics to realize that Pearl Harbor's greatest revelation was America's unreadiness for war. Perhaps more than most Americans, we islanders remember the penalties of unpreparedness. Enemy bombs made no distinction between servicemen and civilians. All of us are resolved never again to be caught off guard. Hawaii, at the crossroads of the Pacific, is a vital link in America's chain of defense. Honolulu, capital of the territory, is the social and commercial center of the islands. Our economy is primarily agricultural. Sugar is our number one industry. Modern farming methods have allowed sugar growers to increase production without spoiling the richness of the soil. Our plantations pay the highest wages in domestic sugar growing areas. One quarter of the sugar consumed on the mainland comes from Hawaii. Sugar grows best in the lowlands and valleys while pineapple, Hawaii's second largest source of revenue, thrives on the uplands. On vast stretches of volcanic mountains and plateaus where only cactus grew years earlier, our pineapple industry now grows three quarters of the world's supply. Ready for picking in summer, the pineapple harvest gives jobs to thousands of college and high school students during vacation. They find the work nourishing as well as profitable. As a paniola, our cattleman, and in recent years, I've watched a century-old industry expand to become an important part of our economy. Most cattle graze on the island of Hawaii, the island which gives the archipelago its name. World famous as a vacation resort, the Hawaiian tourist trade ranks just behind agriculture in the basic industries of the islands. More than 100,000 visitors arrive each year for fun and relaxation. Every ship receives a gala welcome. The weather is probably our strongest lure to tourists. Year round, the daily temperatures average a comfortable 75 degrees. A day when the sun doesn't shine is a rarity and miles of sandy beaches welcome sunbathers. Hawaii is notorious for attracting new settlers. Every year, hundreds of visitors arrive for a brief visit 
then succumb to the charm of the islands and eventually become Kama Ainas, our name for long-time residents. After drawing Hawaii as a duty station, men in all our services tell each other they never had it so good. Although our modern commercial fishing is big business, the old methods are still carried on by native Hawaiians as part of our tradition. A strictly Hawaiian approach is used in the hooky lau, a kind of fishing party. Tea leaves draped over the lines supporting the net scare fish into the trap as the net is closed and hauled ashore. A typical catch may include a dozen different kinds of fish. Our counterpart to a barbecue or a clam bake on the mainland is the luau, which offers chicken, raw fish, poi, coconut and pineapple, as well as roast pig. The hula, performed by Hawaiians before the coming of Western civilization, was Hawaii's grand opera. Dancing and feasting are an important part of island life. Most important to islander and mainlander alike, however, is Hawaii's strategic location. At the start of World War II, the islands were the center of the Allied defense line stretching from Australia to Dutch Harbor, Alaska. Later, they became the jumping off point for our counterattack in the Far East. Lying at the crossroads of the Pacific, the islands are the hub of our Pacific defenses. Any aggressor attacking the mainland from the west must first knock out Hawaii. Out of Red Hill, northwest of Honolulu, comes the fuel for all our weapons of war in this part of the world. From the Pineapple Pentagon, which overlooks busy Pearl Harbor, Army, Navy, and Air Force commanders direct all U.S. military operations in the Pacific. No one is more aware of Hawaii's vital part in the total American defense picture than the islanders themselves. Backing up the regular services, ready to defend our home islands, are to fight anywhere in the world, are the citizen soldiers of Hawaii's National Guard. Its officers and men come from every walk of life. Just how seriously we take the question of preparedness can be seen in our guard enrollment. When orders for the annual encampment are received, Approximately one out of every 25 eligible men in Hawaii responds. The same patriotic spirit which moves a man to join the guard is shown by everyone in Hawaii. Employers encourage their workers and associates to take part in maneuvers. Like most of the men, I look forward to summer field training. Under simulated battle conditions, we will put into practice all we've learned during our regular weekly drills. Leaving is made easier because most of us recall being caught off guard in 41. The armories here, as on the mainland, are the year-round training centers for our guard units. Each summer, they become the gathering points for the annual encampment. Hawaii is actually a group of islands, reefs, and shoals strung out along 1,600 miles of the Pacific. On the major islands, individual units reported airfields for transportation to central Oahu. In an emergency, the Military Air Transport Services airlift could quickly and efficiently bring the full weight of the guard to bear on any trouble spot in the territory. In the past, fighting men from Hawaii set a standard of courage and heroism hard to equal. All of us are deeply conscious of this tradition and we're determined to uphold it. In World War II, islanders with the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team helped set one of the most remarkable combat records of the war.
After 11 long months of continuous action, these volunteers with the 5th Army had earned the wholehearted respect and admiration of every American. Decorations awarded for valor were but token payments of our great indebtedness. Again in Korea, troops from Hawaii with the 5th Regimental Combat Team kept strong our reputation for fighting hearts. It's a reputation which has grown in stature each time we have fought in defense of freedom. Many islanders who received their first military training in Hawaii National Guard received the highest honors a grateful nation can bestow upon its heroes. Many, too, we've left behind on the world's far-off battlefields. Today, the ranks of our Hawaiian Guard companies are filled in large part by veterans of Korea and World War II. They know, as history has proven, that today's field maneuver may be actual combat tomorrow. The airlift, operated by the Military Air Transport Service for our annual encampment, solves a big problem which confronted guardsmen of the past. Separated by miles of open sea, the different units were forced to train independently on their home islands. Now, with a mobility possible only in this air age, we are ready to leave Hickam Field as a unified fighting force. A lot of careful planning goes into the operation long before the first guardsman leaves home. For the thousands of men who with tons of equipment who converge on Oahu by air from widely scattered points among the islands, ground transportation must be waiting, ready to roll right on schedule. Our destination is Kahuku, the northernmost tip of Oahu Island. 5,000 men are underway, anxious to test the combat techniques we worked so hard on during the preceding months. The annual maneuver is the culmination of all our previous training. Squads, platoons, companies, and battalions from the different islands learn to work together as closely knit members of combined arms operations. These separate groups unite to form the territory's two crack regimental combat teams. These days, with trouble likely to break out anywhere in the world without warning, the maneuver provides the best way of keeping all our military units on their toes, ready to strike back hard and fast. A seven mile march over Pupakea Trail to the bivouac area helps toughen muscles we'll soon have to call on for extra drive. Each maneuver has its own objective. Ours is slated to be tactical. Just as our separate squads will learn teamwork fighting side by side, so commanders and staff officers at all levels improve their techniques in supply, intelligence, and tactics under realistic conditions. The maneuver is planned with the same care and intensity that would go into a real campaign. Men who fill the ranks of the new National Guard are of the highest caliber. Point for point, the enlistment standards have been set as high as those of the regular Army. Living in the open as he would in combat, the veteran stays in condition, and the recruit gets in shape fast. As soon as camp is made, final preparations for the mock battle get underway. Communications, the nerve system of every military force, gets top priority. Once contact is made with headquarters, supplies are pinpointed throughout the battle zone. The maneuver is designed to give us the best practical experience outside of actual combat. Short of bloodshed, no holes are barred. Both sides will be scored for their efforts. The situation we're faced with is as old as modern warfare. An aggressive force, represented by our first regimental combat team, has established a beachhead to the east. It's our job, in the role of defender, to smother the aggressor are to drive him into the sea. 
After a thorough briefing, our combat team receives its weapons. Blank ammunition, double checked to prevent accidents, is issued to the infantry. Simulated tank traps are set up on our flanks by demolition teams. Selected roads and trails are planted with dummy anti-tank and anti-personnel mines. There is always a chance that the aggressor may launch a counter-attack of his own. Meanwhile, to the east, the aggressor is moving his own fighting power into position. As in any battle, the aggressor knows only that we intend to drive him out or annihilate him. When we'll launch our attack, or where, or with what weapons and men, he can only estimate. The aggressor, too, has several alternate plans. Right now, he's dug in, ready and waiting for our offensive, planning to stop us dead in our tracks. Zero hour. We push off. As our first assault wave rolls forward, the resistance is light, too light. The aggressor figures he has analyzed our attack plan correctly and puts his own scheme into action. He lets us advance right up to the edge of his first line of defense. start to fan out and give the aggressor the chance he's been waiting for. He can see we've spread ourselves too thin. Here it comes. Counterattack. has taken the bait we've tossed out. He's rushing blind into our trap. We can afford to sit back and wait. In real combat, he'd be a dead duck. Everyone knows his job. Our plan clicks like clockwork. With our observers calling the shots, it's a cinch. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Bazooka and recoilless rifle fire hits are represented by harmless electrically controlled land mines. We've broken the backbone of the counterattack. Now to follow up while the aggressor is still reeling, hammering hard while he tries to cover up. All our reserve power swings into action. Split second coordination keeps the pressure on. We launch a full scale frontal assault as the third phase of our master plan. We force the aggressor to consolidate his strength in the middle of his line. But already our troops are on the move ordered to turn his flank. A noose of steel and muscle tightens around the beachhead. We've got him in a box now and really pour it on. A 
outmaneuvered and outfought, the aggressor tries to retreat. But he's waited too long. Half his force has been ruled out of the battle, and the retreat becomes a rout. The momentum of our drive carries us deep into the aggressor lines. Further resistance would be suicide. Mopping up is all that's left. The victory is ours. But the end of the mock battle does not mark the end of the field training maneuver. Every phase of a real combat operation is recreated for study. One of the most important lessons is emergency aid for casualties. The achievements of the Army Medical Corps are among the most remarkable in the annals of medicine. Fatality rates among our wounded fell from 8% in World War I to 4% in World War II. In Korea, thanks in part to the helicopter, the fatality rate among wounded men was again cut almost in half. The secret lies in getting the injured to the best medical care quickly. The helicopter makes evacuation of the wounded faster and safer than ever before. Perhaps the greatest value of the National Guard's training program lies in its effect on the individual soldier. Under simulated combat conditions, we gain not only a sense of responsibility toward our buddies, but also, and most important, we achieve a feeling of confidence in ourselves. We pray that we shall never again have to use our military skills to defend America against aggression. But should an enemy strike, we pray God for the strength to fight hard and well. All of us who joined in the summer training program this year agree completely on one thing. The two regimental combat teams of the Hawaii National Guard are in the best shape ever. Taken separately, we who form the ranks of the Guard represent all the ethnic groups of the world. Among us are found men of almost every faith. But as a body, we are a tightly knit, well-trained and smooth functioning fighting force. As a people, we are Americans first and Hawaiian Islanders second. But just as every state and territory has its local tradition and heroes, so we in Hawaii too have a heritage that consciously or unconsciously is an integral part of our everyday lives. This spirit is one of the driving forces in the Hawaiian Guard. Governor of the territory, Samuel Wilder King, has summed it up for us. It was my great pleasure on June 20th of uh, this year to review the troops of the Hawaii National Guard during their annual training period. That was my first opportunity to visit the troops in the field after I became, as Governor of Hawaii, the Commander-in-Chief of the Hawaii National Guard the preceding February. The 5,000 marching men who passed in review that day represented far more than a military organization. The citizen-soldier concept on which we have always built our military strength was amply demonstrated by the smart performance of those 5,000 young citizens of Hawaii who have volunteered for guard training. Their interest and enthusiasm is matched by that of their employers who have always cooperated 100% with the National Guard in its effort to build an effective organization. The fact that the attendance at the guard encampment was 98% of all members is further indication of the civic consciousness of our population. Year in and year out, the Hawaii National Guard has been rated among the top organizations in the United States through regular Army inspections. I know the Hawaii National Guard will continue not only to grow in strength, but also to discharge its duties and obligations in an outstanding manner. In an emergency, the Hawaii National Guard is ready to fight side by side with the nation's 5,500 additional guard units. As in Hawaii, in every one of the 48 states, in Alaska, Puerto Rico, and the District of Columbia, America's guardsmen are ready for immediate mobilization. 
our citizen soldiers represent an enormous reserve force backing up our regular army. This vast reservoir of strength has already paid off. In Korea, among the first units to serve with the United Nations Command were the famed 45th Thunderbird Division of Oklahoma and the 40th Infantry Division of California. After contributing a major share to the United Nations successful halting of communist aggression in Korea, guardsmen today are helping to keep the truce line secure. In Europe too, Guard units from Pennsylvania and New England have added new striking power to NATO's army, which lines the perimeter of the Iron Curtain. The urgent need for a strong, alert National Guard in peace as in war cannot be too highly estimated. The importance of the Guard's role in the future of the United States has been best expressed, perhaps, by President Eisenhower, who said, with the van of our forces at Bataan, Salerno, Anzio, Normandy, and Korea, the National Guard has enriched its heritage of 177 years of service to the Republic. Today, its service is of mounting importance to our security and to national leadership toward a stable, peaceful world. Since the early days of American history, the National Guard has played an important role in the nation's defense. Today, our Guard units in Hawaii and on the mainland are better trained, more maneuverable, and in better fighting shape than ever before, thanks to the wholehearted support of the American public. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us next week when we again present another look at the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.